I am a very cheap substitute for Pastor Andrew, but I am very honored and only slightly terrified to have been asked. So, um, so here we go. The scripture text that you have in the bulletin is different than the one that I read. Um, so if any of you know the inclusive Bible, I really like this. And I like it because for me, the language that's used in this version doesn't use gendered language unless there's a, a person named in a story where that's an important detail of the story. Um, and it allows us to imagine, you know, this is humanity we're talking about. So the people in these stories are us, whoever we might be. So let me read from this inclusive Bible. And we're looking at some of the parables of Luke today, chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to give me my share of the inheritance. Jesus replied, friend, who has set me up as your judge or arbiter? Then he told the crowd, avoid greed in all of its forms. Your life isn't made more secure by what you own, even when you have more than you need. Jesus then told them a parable in these words. There was a rich farmer who had a good harvest. What will I do, the farmer mused? I have no place to store my harvest. I know, I'll pull down my grain bins and build larger ones. All my grain and goods will go there. Then I'll say to myself, you have blessings in reserve for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to the farmer, you fool. This very night, your life will be required of you. To whom will all your accumulated wealth go? This is the way it works with people who accumulate riches for themselves, but are not rich in God. May these holy words find wisdom in our hearts. So what happens in this story? Someone who has suffered a financial injustice asks Jesus, actually tells Jesus to settle the score, and Jesus rejects that role. The wronged younger brother orders him to play. Jesus warns the crowd not to put security or to seek security from accumulating things. And then he tells a story about a farmer, already wealthy with multiple grain bins, whose latest harvest exceeds the bin's capacity. The solution for more that can be stored in the bins? More storage! <laughs> How many storage facilities do we see? <laughs> yeah. 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 Mile radius of anywhere in the United States, it seems. So, with years of stores, the farmer thinks, then it'll be time to relax and enjoy. But God calls the rich farmer, calls the rich farmer a fool, and says, your life ends tonight with no one identified to receive the stockpile. The passage in Luke is then summed up with the comparison of a life lived for stuff and a life lived for God. So the historic setting where Luke is writing, men were the property owners, and the eldest son would inherit if the father died without a will. And the cultural expectation was that the eldest son would then portion out the fair share to all the other siblings. And at the time that this was written, there was a huge theological debate going on about just how much should that eldest son receive? Two thirds, yeah, that's fair. Half, maybe three quarters, yeah, that's a lot of responsibility, a lot of work. And I read in one commentary that many of the people leading this theological conversation were rabbis who were often the eldest son. <laughs> I thought that was, mm, yes, very interesting tidbit. What policies are formed and who's there at the table shaping it? Um, so the financial injustice that this younger son experiences um, leads him to just tell Jesus, make it right. But Jesus refuses. And this story comes in Luke just after the crowd would have been told a story about Martha imploring Jesus to intervene and make Mary stop sitting at his feet and help with the chores, <laughs> which she, as a woman in that culture, would be expected to do when important guests were coming. 
and that gets to happen through Jesus. So in both situations, the petitioners have a point. At the level of the rules of the orderly society, the eldest son and Mary aren't acting as expected. And the younger son and Martha are aggrieved. So what does this tension between the expectation that Jesus would side with the presumed underdog and his refusal to order people how to behave to settle a squabble mean? Jesus' words would surely call to mind the story of Moses getting between two people who were fighting in the desert. He tells them to knock it off, and they basically say, who made you the boss of us? <laughs> well, God, actually. <laughs> and you all, when you agreed that you would abide by law and order so that Moses could lead you from slavery, by the way, mind you, to just within sight of the promised land. So here, People are telling Jesus, make people get in line. And Jesus is using words back to them that demonstrate that he is Moses supersized. He says, don't use me to create order. Follow me to live in peace. He reminds them of a new and truly abundant life. Knowing their hearts, he's answering their prayers in a much higher level. How often does that happen to us? It's like, excuse me, I was asking for this, and this is what shows up? <laughs> and sometimes we come to understand, wow, there was really something I was scared. There was really something I needed to pay attention to. There was something I wasn't ready for when I was asking for this other thing. So the younger brother is being spared the much greater injustice of seeming to be validated in a life that was simply pure and infinite greed. There's no point at which stuff can bring us ease because the enjoyment doesn't come from the external, it doesn't come from stuff. It comes from the, out, from the inside out. It's created by sharing our stuff, whatever our stuff might be, our many gifts, for the good of the community. He's telling the community in the earlier story that Mary has chosen the greater path, sitting at the feet of her teacher so that she can be a true disciple to create a new world in which we are equally beloved by virtue of our humanity, not because of accidents of birth, like wealth, gender, ethnicity, sexuality, ability. Our farmer in this story stands alone. No friends or family are with them to carry on good work in the world that could be done with all this stuff. So this farmer clearly is not Joseph, who's asking for God's help to build bigger storage bins. Joseph was storing to save nations. If the rich farmer feels like God is not on their side, Jesus asks, are you on God's side? So it's easy to see how these words speak to us, at least it's easy for me, in 2,000 years after Luke wrote them when we are choking the very life out of our planet with our insatiable consumption, when a very few control vast wealth and power, and the game of retaining that wealth and power is at the expense of our institutions, which are crumbling around our ears, when women are being shoved back into subservient roles of patriarchy and losing autonomy over their very bodies. So these parables, these parables are wonderfully, they're very difficult to say. <laughs> these parables are wonderfully subversive means to get us to look at aspects of our lives. Oftentimes these parables are like, huh? They're kind of like the koans, where it's like, on, on one sense, it's like, this does not make sense. What is one hand flapping? You know, parables often for me are like, wait, what? Um, so they, they invite us to look at aspects of our life that we might not really be comfortable looking at to reflect on the stories that are really at play in our lives. Are we really having a Coke and a smile? Do our happy meals really make us happy? <laughs> the culture marinates us in materialism and tries to hook us over and over and over again with images of how consuming more, spending more will bring us happiness. I feel a great affinity to Luke. I went to grade school at St. Luke's. I knew little about him then, I must say. Uh, 
other than there were flying cows, images of flying cows, which I now later understood to be sacrificial oxen with wings of eagles. But then it was like, what's with the flying cows in this world? <laughs> <laughs> and teaching was a really big deal. The Dominicans were our teachers at that school, and teaching was really important. Learning was important. You know, doing your lessons and really learning um, and, and achieving was very important. And we know bits about what other people have put together about who Luke was. It seems to be agreed upon that he was a physician. And I know from some of his readings uh, that there's wonderful precision, uh, almost uh, medical precision, about the way he describes some of the deformities of people who were healed. Um, he was, he's now actually regarded as the patron saint of both healers and of artists. He was obviously a very well-educated man, and he paid attention to history. That was really important to him, and he was a very gifted writer. Apparently his Greek was, was poetic. It was really very beautiful as well as very philosophical. And I love that he writes about teach Jesus as a teacher, as a healer with a message of salvation that's open to everybody. Luke writes about the women, the poor, the widows, the prostitutes. All of these people are inheritors of the new life, the true riches that Jesus is offering us. Luke is also trying to reach beyond the understanding of life that the traditional Jewish community had. And he's asking us to grow into this message of a welcome for all, Gentile or Jew, all over the world. And these are the people that, that figure in his stories. So this new way of community requires a new understanding of how to use the riches of the material world in service of true abundance, a new life of radical generosity and compassion for the marginalized. The call to us is to bring heaven to earth, to align with God, whose grace is abundantly given for all to enjoy in a community that is based on a covenant. Jesus exclaims many times in Luke's writing that things are different now. We're out of this transactional mode. We're out of a contract relationship. And instead, we're in a mode where the gifts of God are not to be abused, and the especially, the most, and most especially, the most precious gift, which is our lives. So Jesus tells us that old way of judgment, compliance to externally imposed order, that's gone. And in its place is adherence. Adherence based on our inner desire, our freedom to choose to live in covenant about how we want to be. Not about richness, richness is not in stuff, but richness is in God at work in our lives, sharing a vision of generous, generous living during our lives. So simply sharing a bit more is not going to cut it if our heart is still miserly. Jesus lived this example of giving up everything for our sakes. Every spiritual gift is at our disposal to become truly generous in what matters for a rich life. Without this spiritual wealth, we can't have the life that Jesus offers, a life made more abundant by investing in our community, in each other, generously offering our gifts in service to each other. So Jesus was talking to a small rat gathered crowd, and he was speaking in parables. And he said, what is the kingdom of God like? Jesus is asking that. <laughs> what shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree and the birds perched in its branches. So when I thought about this parable, it's me, I'm a cook, I'm a baker, I went to my enormous spice rack and looked at these little mustard seeds. Sure enough, passing around, they're like the tiny, and my cracked peppercorns are bigger than these things. Grew into an enormous tree. Now, how many, like me, has probably heard this parable dozens of times, right? And every time we, I've heard it anyway, and it's been preached about, the pastor always uses this as a symbol of the smallest sprinkling of seeds, you know, the word by Jesus. Just a few humble beginnings 
can grow into this massive, supportive structure of tree, the faith that will spread across the globe. And you, as the birds, can, you'll be supported in this faith. You can find a home. You can nest within this faith. But then, I was thinking about it a little more. I was trying to pull up a couple pictures, you know, to show you to, as examples of this. Can you turn the slide, please? And I saw, wait a minute. Here, so here's on the left of this graphic of this ginormous mustard seed tree, enough that a whole flock of birds in it. And okay, I'm a city girl, but I come from a long line of farmers. I still have two siblings who live on farms. And I'm sorry, mustard plants do not grow into huge trees. And I have never seen a bird perched on a mustard seed. I mean, that's the picture. Of the, I mean, they're a cover crop. They're this little, you know, about as strong as clover. So I'm like, I is there something I'm not getting here? I mean, I know it's a parable, trying to not get into much of my head. <laughs> but then, you know, a, a couple months ago, some of us went through this Bible study program, and it was called From Exodus to Jesus and Beyond, Progressive Christianity, Social Justice, and the Bible. And the main take I got out of that was like, put aside what everybody's been telling you the Bible means. And look at it, try to look at it through a different lens. And so I looked at this and I thought, so what are all those birds supposed to mean? So what do I do? What I always do, I turn to Google. <laughs> and one of the great things about the internet is, uh, is for our purposes, is like every translation known to mankind of the Bible is now online and it's searchable. So I just did a search for where's every time in the Bible where it talks about these flock of birds, especially gathering in trees. And could you maybe go to the next slide? And to my surprise, the symbol of birds was used over and over again, not as this lovely, like, supported dove cooing in a tree, but rather as a symbol of evil. In fact, right in Luke, right in the group of parables that we're studying with the mustard seed, the symbol of the birds is used. It was in the, the parable about the sower of seeds, and it says a farmer went out to sow his seed, meaning Jesus, presumably, and he, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, it was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. I'm like, wait a minute. Seeds I thought were supposed to be the word God, and the birds are eating it up. <laughs> and then, you know, the disciples, which I was actually, I'm, I've always liked this part where you read about it. The disciples get a little frustrated, you know, like, why don't you just tell us what these parables mean? <laughs> and so this one, he actually did. So in Luke, we have Jesus speaking. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. The bird is the devil in this parable. And not only that, that's repeated in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And, you know, depending on your translation of the Bible, I was using the NIV, and in one of them, refers to birds as the evil one. Some of them refer to them as the demons, uh, the devil, Satan. I'm like, whoa, quite a different picture than I've always heard this. And what about this ginormous tree? Can I have the next slide? It did the same thing. I'm like, okay, this is getting interesting now. I pulled it up. <laughs> I'm like, where is there a huge, like, enormous, like, out of normal size tree, particularly if it has birds in it? <laughs> and that took me to Daniel. So in Daniel, we have the king of Babylon, who was, I think, the second king of Babylon, who had, like, one of the most glorious and prosperous and abundant kingdoms. And he had this dream. And in the dream, he saw this enormous tree in the middle of his kingdom. He describes it like this. Before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. 
It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter and the birds lived in its branches. But then the king went on describing his dream. There before me was a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. And he went, the king went and asked all of the sages to interpret this dream for him. And none of them, oh, I don't know if they couldn't or they didn't want to say this to the king. But finally Daniel said, I hate to tell you this king, but that, king, that tree you're supposed to cut down, that's like you and this ginormous kingdom that you have created. And I thought, that's the empire that we keep talking about in this church, right? So I thought, so is, is the parable of the mustard seed telling us that these little tiny things, if planted, if cared for, can grow into this beautiful word of Christianity across the world? Or is it trying to warn us that the structure, you know, the church and the trappings and the branches and the leaves can get out of control, lose their humility of what our religious faith was really supposed to mean? And are we supposed to be cutting down the tree? But then I read a bit further in Daniel, and I love this part, because I thought, surely we can't be told to be cutting down Christianity. It goes on, and after it says to cut down the tree and release the animals, it says, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. And I thought, okay, they're saying cut off the ginormous overgrown that has the evil and the birds and all of that. Set it free, leave the roots in the fertile field for the common people. Because this isn't a church, it's not supposed to be a church of structure, of hierarchy. So then I thought, well, is this, so is it about this beautiful story of the spreading of our faith? Or is it this dire warning that it's going to get out of control and we've let it go to hell? And then I thought, well, maybe the answer is yes. It's both. <laughs> because, and I thought, you know, then I thought, why is Andrew having me talk about this? <laughs> What do I know about this? I am not a biblical scholar. And even in this congregation, there's many, many, many people who have studied the Bible much more than I have. And then I thought, well, he didn't ask me to be a biblical scholar. He said, please give your reflections. And I thought, who cares what my reflections are? And then I went back to where the disciples were asking in the Gospels of Jesus. It's like, why do you speak in parables? I mean, can you see this? I mean, for God's sake, why don't you just tell us what you're supposed to be? And the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, I, I, especially informed by the Bible study that I did and some of the thinking that Andrew's preaching has inspired in me, you know, I'm reading the Bible differently these days. And I'm reading it with a, you know, looking for different sides. And I'm thinking, and at different times of my life, different passages in the Bible have spoken to me in different ways. And I thought, well, maybe it's this beautiful piece of art or poetry, and it's supposed to mean different things to us at different times in our life. It's not supposed to be a recipe, a cookie cutter, and it's not supposed to be easy to understand. There's many parts in the Bible where it says most will not understand, and it's hard. So when the disciples said, you know, just tell me what this means, why are you speaking to everybody in parables? And I thought, well, Jesus isn't speaking to scholars. He's speaking to everyday people just like us, right? And Jesus says in Matthew, I speak to them in parables 
because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. So I think the parable means what it says in your heart to you at the time that I need it. At least that's what it means to me. Thank you.